Hello, um, I'm Bridget Minamore and welcome to Apples and Snakes at Home. This is series three, episode four. Hopefully you have watched the first three episodes where we have been bouncing around the country and listening to different poets read their work. But if not, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to keep up to date with all of the gigs in the rest of the series, as well as go back and look at the other gigs that we've done already. Um, if you don't know, if you're new with us today, series three is going to focus, has been focusing on the theme of home with artists exploring the idea of belonging in an increasingly fragile fragmented world. Uh, Apples wanted to use this as an opportunity to amplify the voices of underrepresented groups by focusing this programming on black and brown artists living in England uh, all over the country who may feel at home in more than one place or identity. Uh, today we will be with Kai Miller and Shagifta K. Iqbal. Hello. Hi. Uh, and we'll also hear a specially commissioned poem from Manira Pilgrim, who is, yeah, a great writer. Um, I'm really excited. How are you? Kai, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. Uh, I'm, if I look sheepish, it's because no one would know that this is starting a little bit late because of me, but I'm good otherwise if sheepish. <laughs> sheepish is a good Are you Shagifta? I'm well, thank you. Um, it it meant that I was able to get an extra cup of tea in, so it's fine. <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah, I'm well, apart from uh, dealing with... Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a loaded question, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've started saying uh, not, I hope, you know, I hope this email finds you well, because I feel like it's finding no one well. I'm just saying I hope you're, I'm finding you as well as you can be at this time. Um, <laughs> Where is home in the physical yeah. sense right now? Where are you coming from? Shagifta, where are you? So right now, my physical home at the moment is in Bristol, um, which is actually where I was born and raised. And so I kind of feel like I've come full circle um, in a strange way. Mm. And have you been here all, have you been in Bristol throughout lockdown? I have, which has been interesting because before Bristol was always my base, whereas I worked in London, my social life was in London. Um, and now being full time in Bristol is kind of making me think, OK, so this is actually home because when they say stay at home, they mean stay in Bristol, whereas <laughs> home has been everywhere. I think when you're a performer or a writer, you kind of tend to dip in and out of spaces, um, yeah. compartmentalize different parts of your life. So home is apparently Bristol <laughs> yeah definitely I felt quite I felt that was quite loaded when it was like stay at home and I was like oh home okay okay I've got to stay here in, in this corner of southeast London um mm. I, what about you where's home uh so home right now at this present moment physically is Exeter mm -hmm. uh yeah which which is strange it, it's a strange Strange kind of home. So I, I came to Exeter because of work, uh, but um, I guess like Shagifta, because I travel so much, um, Exeter was always a kind of quarantine. Um, so, so life happened outside and you came back here uh, to work and not to see anyone. So there's no social life here. There's it, it was always, this is the writing space, this is the lockdown space. It, I, I actually thought about it in these terms. And so when it's now become really the lockdown space and the quarantine space um, imposed on me and not of my making it, it, it makes it very strange. And, and I wonder about my relationship to the city um, because, because my relationship, it has always been exactly this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's... How, how long have you been in Exeter? Not very long, probably two years. Okay, okay. Did you, um, did you, how have you found it? How is it? As I said, it's, I, I have no major relationship to the city other than mm -hmm. being at home, really. Life always happened outside of it. Mm -hmm. Um, which makes me think, oh God, I, I should begin, I, I should relate to the city a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, because that, that just hasn't been, you know, it's, I mean, I, I was probably traveling every, every two weeks and you'd be gone for weeks at a time. Uh, 
and that was fine you know that there is, it was, to me it was a healthy social life that happened outside so when you came back you didn't want to do that uh but as i said lockdown has changed that relationship i mean it, it can't actually change it but it's made me think about it yeah completely i think for so many of us a bit more um, it, yeah. it's the best yeah. way to relate to yeah mm. I think for, um, for so many of us, yeah, this lockdown has been an opportunity to just really look at ourselves in and, and look at our home environments in a different way. Um, it's taken away a lot of the romance of home, I found. The way I might romanticise or, or, or glamorise, not, not just the home I'm in, but like the other homes and the other places I might call home. Everything has felt a lot more real, I don't know. Um, but maybe that's just, yeah, thinking of my family home in Ghana and my family there I like at no point did I seriously consider going to Ghana for lockdown and just staying well, like, <laughs> well I know did um and that made me really reassess is it is it as, is it as much of a home for me as I as I like to say it is you know I might say that I have two homes but do I really if if at no point in this time did I seriously consider going off you know to somewhere much more yeah. rough, more friendly <laughs> than here maybe it's not necessarily the home that I might romanticize it in my in my in my head or even in my work um and obviously both of you uh have roots in other parts of the world and have homes to some degree in other parts of the world have you been thinking about that relationship a little bit more hmm. um I kind of haven't had have, I mean being an artist I've got lots of friends who are like okay I'm not doing lockdown in England I'm not paying London rent and writing everything online I'm going to go to and then they go to all these wonderful places with sunshine um I think that's been I've been watching that from afar and thinking that sounds like a good idea but I think for me home is really kind of excuse the pun hit home that home is in people uh for me and I have two young children and mm -hmm has been about creating a space for them which is part of my responsibility but also it helps me shape a sense of home and a sense of place um, and I think that's kind of been a, an interesting thing whereas before I was always thinking okay Bristol is a base this is where I work from this is where the kids go to school um, and then my life happens in other cities outside of that um, and now it's made me kind of reevaluate that but also having really interesting conversations with the kids when they were at home. Um, then they're spending more time with me. I was homeschooling, <laughs> which started off really <laughs> good. I was full of high hopes. I had plans and schedules. We had a study room. It all went out the window at the end of it. But, um, <laughs> but we had really interesting conversations and I feel like I've gotten to know them as little people rather than mm. collecting them from school, dropping them off and doing you know bits and pieces in between. So that's been really wonderful. Um, and yet home for me is really very much about, about the three of us, my two children. Um, and I feel like before I was very much about okay, having a base, having somewhere stable, but I think as long as we are solid um, and we work well together, then it doesn't matter where I move them. Mm -hmm. I think actually children are more resilient. I think that's what I've learned. Children are incredibly resilient. Whereas mm -hmm. when I was kind of thinking, oh, I've got to kind of really baby them, put them in cotton wool, make sure there's stability, make sure nothing changes in their life um, and changes happen. And they kind of take it on the, on the chin. They kind of get on with it much more, much better than adults actually have done so yeah that's my long-winded response about home <laughs> no that's lovely that's such a beautiful sentiment um yeah just how old are your kids sorry i'm just being curious now seven and nine Aww. so that's, they're a nice age they're not quite teenagers yet so yeah. i haven't got any of the sass yet <laughs> yeah <laughs> Excellent. Oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll take that lovely sentiment and we'll start reading some poems and sharing some work with each other. Um, Shikifta, we'll start with you. Um, for those of you who have not heard Shikifta read before, you're in for a treat. Um, Shikifta Kate Iqbal uh, is the founder of the Universe Poetry Collective and Kyoto Bristol. Uh, she was long listed for the Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellowship and is an award-winning writer, workshop facilitator and TEDx speaker. She has been described by Galdem magazine as a poet whose work leaves you validated for aching, which is a beautiful 
like thing for someone to say about you just I'm just gonna throw that out there um her poetry collection jam is for girls girls get jam has been recommended by nikesh shikla as a social political masterclass her poetry film borders has won several awards and has been screened across international film festivals including the london short film festival the glasgow short film festival and the athena film festival she is currently when she is not homeschooling <laughs> or homeschooling maybe <laughs> writing her second poetry collection and debut novel. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to hear from today but I'm excited nonetheless. Shikha, so please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, that's a lovely introduction. Um, so the first piece I'm going to share is um, a very short poem that I was commissioned to write by the Wye Valley Festival uh, which is based in Wales and I'm just across the bridge in Bristol so I have a very strong relationship with Wales um, and my son, this is dedicated to my son whose name is it turned out is Welsh as well, um, and it's called um, <clears throat> it's called Idris, uh, which is his name. In ancient times, your name was spoken here, beneath the thickets and the shadows of trees. Its echo can be heard in the river of this valley, a gentle a gentle lull that calls you here. Once, centuries before, when you were a giant, you stepped over waters to reach the crest of mountain sides. Your legends still lie here. The word of you is still a magic here that ties people and place across time. These footsteps of yours, they have been here since the birth of these lands and the wise rush of river. You will always be welcome here. You are one and the same, this place of forest and stone and water. The ground under your feet does not turn away your curiosity, but welcomes the gentle tread and it awaits the new stories that you will tell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was so, so these always feel so intimate because I feel like you're always just speaking to me, <laughs> which was <laughs> lovely. Um, how lovely. It's so funny. I did know that Idris was both a Welsh name and it was also a Welsh name um, only because I have a friend who wanted to call her kid Idris. Um, and then her partner's husband was like, her partner's partner's mother was like oh the Welsh name and she was like no after Idris Elba um and it was a whole <laughs> a whole thing where they were working it out um <laughs> how did, what did you say sorry before him it didn't exist as a name so yeah <laughs> yeah obviously um where did you start with that poem um, did you start with wanting to write about your son or did you start with I don't know the imagery in the so the commission it. Um, it was around uh looking at people of colour in, um, and I use the term people of colour, um, I know people have different versions, um, but people of colour in spaces of nature. Um, and I have spent a lot of time writing about nature and looking at our relationship with nature and our space in nature and being sort of on the doorstep of Wales and going quite regularly into the mountains, into the Brecon Beacons um, and the coast there because it's much better than Western Supermare in Bristol. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time there and I studied in Wales and I think it's always really interesting having conversations and, and when I lived in Wales about what it means to be a person of colour in the Welsh landscape. Um, and I think it's quite difficult in many ways because you have Welsh people who are trying to reclaim their sense of Welshness and their sense of identity after being subjugated by the English people for so long. Um, so there was very little room to then carve out space for people of colour within that because it's like, well, we're just kind of making sense of who we are and, you know, trying to then get another identity in there as well is quite difficult. Um, and speaking to my friends who, who are people of colour who speak the Welsh language, um, and what that means to them. I think those are conversations we had quite often and part of the commission was looking at the space and how it lends itself to other identities and our relationship with landscape, our relationship to, to land and, and boundaries. And I think I was writing at a time when Wales had gone into a lockdown um, and was very specific about the English not being allowed to come and visit. And then the English were coming and visiting and booking Airbnbs and how that kind of was manifesting itself and the and the sort of distinction lines between who is Welsh enough, who who owns what bit of land, who can travel where. Um, I think that was really kind of 
really heightened at that stage of writing um and i just wanted to kind of explore that through my son whose name at the time when i named him it was an arabic name um, and then later i found out it was also a welsh name and there's a giant who was named idris and you have the uh, idris Kader up in in wales um and that kind of really triggered off a lot of feeling um, and thought about my children and their sense of belonging in these spaces and thinking about my parents when they used to take me for walks into the countryside or we went to Clevedon Beach and how out of place I would feel if my mum was wearing shawakamis and traditional clothing and then we pulled out a picnic of samosas and rice and curry and I was like no mum we should be having fish and chips and standing out but how how we own those spaces and how uncomfortable we feel and how do we make that home because it is home it's on my doorstep um so yes that's where the poem came from so interesting I also I just yeah big up all the aunties who wore their traditional wear to go because my mum and her friends and their church group for years would go to like all these random parts of England just for their like day trips on a Sunday and they'd go in like the full like Ghanaian print and, like, <laughs> and everything and when I was a kid I was mortified whereas now obviously with a bit of hindsight and age I just I just love it I just love that they're and my mum and dad would take me when my grandma came over she was like in her 80s never step, left Ghana and she came to the UK you know she didn't even own a jacket really um but they would take her on all these day trips to like Blackpool and Broadstairs and so we have all these pictures of them like in giant puffer coats but in the cloths and like my mum wears a headscarf and all of this stuff and yeah I, I'm so sad now looking back that I felt so embarrassed and I felt because it's more about how I don't feel like I belong really isn't it and I think when you are uh an immigrant who's maybe first generation in this country you have a lot less of the tricksy you feel a lot less you feel a lot more secure of your sense of self and so you just don't care if you want to wear if you want to wear what you wear all the time to go to like some rap mountain you're fine whereas I'm there going oh no what's my identity help <laughs> and seeing my mum and my aunties yeah really oh god that's take that's given me so many memories you're just saying that it's lovely Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the only one who was like, oh, why, why? But I think also as teenagers, you just want to fit in. You don't want to be a family who stand out. You know, we were a big family. There's five of us. So there's like, you know, we really are bringing lots of attention on ourselves. We're loud. We're, we're all the things that you shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, it's something I really wanted to write about in that, in that piece. You did so beautifully. And yeah, thank you. Um, and you've got your other piece for us? Yes, and so my second piece is slightly longer, um, and this one was commissioned by the Barbary Foundation, um, and it was about, again, lockdown and, and the idea of what home means, and my children uh, spend half the week with me and the other half with their dad, and so that time that we spend away, it initially took us a while to get used to the fact that, you know, we're spending time away from each other, um, so we used to write notes to one another um, and my children have specifically said to me that I've got to credit them in <laughs> any reading of this poem that they partook in writing some of this work um, through some of the notes that we sent to each other um, and it's called A Handful of Home. Your feet are as heavy as eyelids. They crush mint as they go. That walk it shames the air, it tells everyone the tale of how you want to be reborn with wings instead. Manifest yourself as love in this violent place. Stop the frost from gathering at your throat while you sing out another version of this world. One where buildings have disappeared to be replaced by fields, mountains, lakes, and just the one beacon of a lighthouse. And I share it with you, my children, where water cannot hold fish, sky cannot hold moon here, horizon cannot hold fingertips of grass here. Hands swing heavy between us, knuckles white, fingers entwined, hand in hand. We walk like that, hand in hand in the shadows, under a burning night in the silence, side by side with your prayers caught in my throat. In fact, you were the first to notice that my hands have began to resemble my mother's. It was a gradual, reluctant recognition, folds of skin settling gentle as snow, vibrant veins, loud crease between thumb and forefinger. I remember being a child and watching my mother's hands age, not her face, 
or her eyes or her hair. She remained the same in my memory. Sometimes when I see an old photo, I am taken aback at how my eyes did not see the passing of time. And now I walk with my children. You always holding on to these old hands of mine. Your hand always reaching out to close the space between us. The way you hold my hand tells me so much about you. The way your energy in your small fist runs through my fingers and explodes in my chest. It makes me realize that this world is the size of a giant, but it cannot hold the whole of our hearts. And when we walk its body once again, we will, know, we will walk knowing that we have survived it all. Separate as stars, but held together by a love that spans the expanse of this universe's singular breath. In this world, I will hold my hand out behind me and I will be met with such a sense of belonging when your hand grabs hold of my fingers. And I will know there is someone there, at my side. What power your little hand wields to make me feel I have come home again, to a place where there are yellow flowers. Everything suspends with hope, potential, the absurdity of possibility. I will hold this truth close to my chest. I will make sure it stays feather tight. I will tend to it daily and wait and listen for it to sing back with a heartbeat. Thank you so much for that beautiful piece of writing. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking so much of lineage and, and the relationship that has with home, sort of beyond family, but more what comes, who came before us and who came after us. Yeah, I, I saw like a meme, my mum sent me a meme, like mums like to send memes on WhatsApp. Um, and it was like a list of, um, if, you, if you're alive today, you have two, you have one mother, you have, you, and then you have two grandmothers and then basically all the women. Yes. Up to, and if you go back, I think 10 generations, that means, I can't remember how many it is now, like, because I didn't read the meme or engage with it in the way that you, you, you don't or I don't um, but it was like a hundred and something women had to have survived in the last whatever years for you to be here and she sent it to me like isn't this great and I you know I was kind of dismissive but yeah I was just thinking of that and and just thinking of yeah all of how that lineage can ground us and, and root us in a sense of home and I'm guessing when you're a parent that's just so much bigger in, in the way that you've just been describing. Yes, and I think you also look to the future a lot as well. So I think m most of this writing happened about reimagining the world, reimagining what the world looked like. Um, and at the time that I was writing this during the lockdown, um, so my background is I'm from Zad Kashmir, from Meepur, um, so Pakistani. Um, and there was a news story at the time, which was really disturbing, but there was a, um, a young girl who was the same age as my son, um, who worked as a domestic servant, a child domestic servant, um, and she was murdered by her employers. And it was just a really horrific event that kind of the, the rippled to here in the UK when we heard about it. Um, and the reason why she was um, murdered was because she set a parrot free. So she opened the cage and allowed it to, and it was a very expensive parrot or a very expensive bird. Um, and I think there was just something so deeply innocent in that and really kind of touching and moved us in many ways. So my children and I, we did speak about it and we talked about how we could reimagine what being on this world is like, because there's lots of conversations happening in school as well with them about extinction rebellion, our relationship with the animals in, in the world and, and our purpose here. So I think it was very disheartening to hear the news, but then it was a sense of real empowerment when the, when the two of them sat down and talked about, okay, well, what do birds mean to us? What does, what does flight mean to us? What does freedom mean to us? What does it mean to be a child in this world? And what is being left behind by the grown-ups uh, to us when we come into our own, <clears throat> into our own persons? Um, and so I think that was a really pivotal moment in the writing of that of that piece, um, thinking about freedom and thinking about what we're leaving behind um, for our children. Um, but also the, the strength of young people, you know, just that just holding somebody, some young person's like my daughter's hand sometimes, it's just so full of life. She's just, I feel like, you know, when you have one of those dogs that just makes you run around after it. <laughs> 
um, and it's powerful and she's only six. So when you're wondering around after somebody, you think, you know what, there's, they're only little, but there's so much, there's so much life and so much energy, mm. um, so much wisdom. So um, yeah, it was kind of in honor of, of young people, I think, children. Mm. Who have just a different relationship to home in so many ways. I think it's so much easier in some ways um when you're younger to to really be aware or maybe it's just because I'm more distracted by work and life and all of this stuff but to just be more aware of the fact that our home is this whole planet and the whole planet is at our fingertips and we need to look after it and we have like the dirt and trees and the ground and all of yeah and I mean I'm a city kid I grew up very far away from a lot of nature and still am still do live in a city um but on the few times I do venture beyond my like concrete jungle, I'm, I'm always struck by how I remember those moments when I was little so much more, just being out in nature for the few times that I was and, and seeing it and feeling it and understanding it. Um, and yeah, the life that that can give you and, and, and yeah, in so many ways. Oh, that's beautiful. You're, ooh. But also, I think like as a grown up, I cut off again compartmentalize different parts of my life. So when I'm going to the mountains in Wales, I'm I'm going into nature. Whereas I'll be walking with my daughter to school, and she'll stop and go, "Mum, moon." It's around her constantly, you know, the clouds, the sky, the moon, the trees. It's and I think even in city, because we, you know, we're in Bristol, so it is city life. Um, I think it's easy to kind of switch off and not see that because you're so kind of focused on your school run, going to work, getting to your meetings. Um, and so they really bring that into your world and make you remember that it's, it's not so that you've got to make such an effort uh, to reconnect in some shape or form. It's, it's quite, it can be done in small ways, which is, I think, uh, I think something we've forgotten as we've gotten older. Yeah, something we've forgotten, but something we can try and remind ourselves a little bit better, I hope. Um, thank you so much, Shigifta. That was beautiful. Um, yeah, still so many thoughts in the head, but we've still got half the show to go. Um, next up, we are going to watch our video from Minera Pilgrim. Um, I'm excited because I haven't seen this yet. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, she's not here with us uh, in sort of body, but obviously we're watching her video and if you haven't seen her perform when we can get back to performances whenever that will be uh, please do because she's one of the most engaging performers i've ever seen um minera pilgrim is an international poet writer and cultural producer living between bristol and london she is one half of the muslim female duo poetic pilgrimage uh, she conducts expressive based purpose-driven workshops in women's groups community groups schools universities campfires and wherever man, humankind can commune. She is a writer for BBC Radio 2's Pause for Thought and is the current artist in residence with the English Touring Theatre. Uh, one other thing that isn't in this bio, but I'm gonna say is that she um, also uh, is part of a collective called Black Mus Muslim Women Bike, which is great. And I last saw her when I was with my Women of Colour biking collective going for a big bike ride and we like linked up and it was honestly delightful um and so yeah please check them out because the videos on that instagram make me smile every single day um let's watch her video they ask me why i'm single i shy away from the truth spiritual women attract broken men and like a nurse i tend to them it's not that I've never had relationships, it's just there's a thin line between lover and healer. I am often both and he is often neither. He is the one in need and I mostly have the ability to rejuvenate when I deplete. They come to me wounded and it would seem my womb has a thing for making my heart their remedy. Them idling on sacred ground, somebody else's sacred house. I act placid as they set God's house alight to keep them warm. And when they're done, I out their flames with acid, scooping up the flesh that's left behind. Knowing these scars were healed with time. Because who does not want a woman who can heal like alchemy? Who can ease pains and sorrows, mixing elixirs out of her tears, clothes and aloes? Please tell me, 
who does not want a woman who will give all of herself until she is hollow. God's home is hollow. I am shallow yet drowning still. It's best I'm single. That's God's will. Pen has lifted feather and quill. We are remodeling house into home. So the next man who enters will have to take off his shoes and bow at God's throne. Amazing. Um, Minera, if you're watching, thank you so much for contributing that. Um, well, yeah, I, I understand why you'd submit that video when we're thinking about home, just because it's made me think of two things. I guess the words made me think a lot of the ways we make homes out of people and the, 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 the positives and negatives within that and what that can mean. But just watching her tying her headscarf and taking it off and tying a headscarf, really reminded me of the way clothes can feel like home you know just the way that we wrap ourselves in certain things and like my mum uh wears headscarves almost all the time and I really I think if I got home and she wasn't there and she wasn't in a scarf and she was just at home I'd feel really I'd, I'd be like oh who's who's this who's this isn't my home especially when I was young <laughs> I had more hair and she used to tie it up um yeah anyway I'm gonna I'm gonna throw those two thoughts out there and see if you've got anything to say to that I, I think I think Manira of course is an um, incredible writer um and really kind of a lot of times I'm thinking about something and she articulates it so well I think um it's these are conversations we have quite regularly because she's based in Bristol so <laughs> we meet up quite <laughs> Mm. About, okay so <laughs> let's talk about relationships and I think uh, something that really people have been reflecting on in the last few months in terms of um, who you're living with who what kind of relationship you are in currently how do you maintain that relationship and is it now that you are not having the distractions of a social life and work and family and it's just the two of you is it is it fulfilling um, and I think I remember speaking to so my sisters currently in East Asia, that's where she's living. And she said, as soon as the lockdown in Wuhan was over, suddenly the divorce rates kind of rocketed <laughs> because people suddenly were like, that's the, this is the one life I have and this is the person I am with. And is it, <laughs> is it working <laughs> 24 yeah. hours a day with this person? Um, and I think it's really interesting that Manira talks about just the fragility of human relationships and and our roles in them and how sometimes they can be so consuming um, without us realizing so I think um, that's an incredible piece of writing um, and I, I love the video I loved how she's also kind of this idea of womanness and tying up your hijab but also she's doing her eyebrows she's doing she's tidying away her mustache you know in the, in the video I think these are things that we don't see when we look at womanhood and we don't want to know but now that we're at home and there's mm. no eyebrows for us <laughs> we're having to do those things for ourselves i think it's really causing to question a lot of things about what it means to be a woman um and how we carry that and how we maintain relationships as well mm. so about manira forever yeah i think there's so much to be said about are changing relationships with our own bodies and and, and faces mm. and stuff in lockdown. I've just everyone. If if there's anyone who wears the same things that they are wearing before this lockdown, I want to meet them because <laughs> I've had to really after two months of staying in pajamas, I had to force. I had to say no. I'm getting dressed every day, or else I'm not going to get any work done. <laughs> um, and now yeah. I put my jewelry on every day, which is my hard limit, or else I just act like I'm a, I'm at home, even though I am. But if my jewelry's on, I'm like no. She, she can work, she can do six hours of Zoom or whatever. <laughs> um, how are you going to say something? Get me through. <laughs> Wait, sorry, what? 
What do we? I think you're going to say something. Sorry. Or oh no, not really. But but no, I'm just I, I'm I'm listening and agreeing with these with these thoughts and these ideas. Uh, I, I mean, at the beginning of the lockdown, the first lockdown, what I remember just randomly is the fatigue of it and the depression of it creeping in and then i woke up one day with the weird thought of what if i was still in the last relationship i was in and the fact that i was now alone felt so joyful and wonderful mm -hmm. like i had escaped the worst bullet ever and i just thought oh thanks Fuck. Uh, so so yeah, that 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 relationship with with other people who, yeah, it it, it does. Did this period does bring that all in? Uh, yeah, who do we want to create homes with? Um, but the, the other thing that I loved about the video was just just that I keep on having about how. I guess how homes are imagined, I mean, how all places are imagined and places are imagined by layering one place on top of another place. And just, just, just how you do that with, with our rituals or, or our dress or, you know, whatever it is, just how we continually layer one place upon another place and therefore create, create home really. It's fascinating. Yeah, really fascinating. Uh, and I think you're not alone to be to have that thought about you know I, I'm not in that relationship anymore uh, I mean I had lots of friends who broke up in you know those that strange fortnight where there were just rumors about god knows what and people say you know the army's gonna be on the streets all of this stuff but I have more a few friends who broke up with their with their partners because they just were like if we're in lockdown and I'm with this person alone for six months I we will kill each other yeah uh, and so, yeah, maybe it's for the, in lots of ways, I think it was for the best. But I also have friends who decided to lock down with their very recent partners, which so far has been far more successful than I guessed would be in March. Mm. I was definitely the voice of don't do that. And now I've been proven um, so far kind of wrong. <laughs> um, but Kai, I think it would be great to hear some poems from you now. Um, Hopefully, again, our audience has seen Camilla read or read some of his work. Uh, but if not, again, I'm really excited because I don't think I've ever seen you read before, um, despite having read your work. And yeah, I'm very excited for this performance, even though it is not um, in the flesh. Uh, Kai Miller is a poet, a novelist, an essayist, a short story writer and a broadcaster. His books include the novel Augustown and the poetry collection The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion, which won the Forward Prize in 2014. It is a beautiful collection. If you have not read it, please do. Um, he's also a professor of English and creative writing at the University of Exeter. Take it away. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I think I'll probably read a, a couple poems, two or three from this collection that's very much on the nose. Um, and it's, it's that moment when I first moved from Jamaica to the UK. And I guess I was thinking a lot about, just in a very, very literal way, what does it mean to be in this new place and create a new home here? Um, so yeah, so, and then I'll read a poem after that's probably very, very different. Uh, but this is from a series, from a sequence of poems called In This Country. How we became the pirates. In this country, you have an accent. In the pub, a woman mocks it. You want to ignore her, but wonder how many hearts is she being bold for? Hate in this place is restrained as the landscape, buried usually under a polite chair's mate. And what a thing to mock the way we shape words differently. But maybe it's the old colonial hurt of how we became the pirates, dark people, reading English from the English, stealing poetry from the poets. So English poetry is no longer from England. You swear, lady, if I start a poem in this country, 
it will not be yours. Uh, the only thing far away. In this country, Jamaica is not quite as far as you might think. Walking through Peckham in London, West Moss Road in Manchester, you pass green and yellow shops where tie-headed women bargain over the price of the sheen. And beside Jamaica is Spain, selling large yellow peppers, lemon to squeeze onto chicken. Beside Spain is Pakistan, then Egypt, Singapore, the world. Here, strangers build home together, flood the ports with curry and papayas in Peckham and on Moss Road, the place smells of more than just patty or tandoori. It smells like Mumbai, like Castries, like Princess Street, Jamaica. Sometimes in this country, the only thing far away is this country. And I'll probably just read one last one from that section. Um, after all, you do not know. In this country, having just arrived, you might be desperate enough to buy plantains online. After all, you do not know where to find things like ground provisions or heat or the sounds of your people. At night, you look through the hopeful window of a computer screen, waiting for Jamaica to come falling through and fill your flat. It will happen, you think, if you stay awake, keep the channels open, Google the right words like Kumina, Pocomania, or Elverine, your mother's name. If you find a place where you might click on a hand of plantain, remembering then the yellow insistence of morning food as if the sun rose from your small plate. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, totally can see why you read, why you started with these poems. Um, I mean, I grew up in South East London around Peckham, so I know those smells and those sights uh, really well, but I think obviously when you grow up there, it's easy to, or it's been easy for me to forget the importance of those spaces to the people who came before me, to like my, what it must have been like for people like my mother and her friends when they first got to this country, just being like, what is this? Yeah. And my experience with accents and people not understanding them and all of that and finding these little pockets of home, right? Mm hmm mm. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess it comes back to that that thing I was I was just saying about how how we take ideas with us and we impose it on the landscape. We, um, you know, we we're, we're taking ideas of home and what do you put on the wall? What do you put at the door? That we we recreate things, and that's that's always kind of magical for me. So I, I guess for me, on the other hand, not growing up in England to come to the UK and find places where this place that I had just left had been recreated. <laughs> it's kind of just like, what, what the hell? Or, or I guess the, the, the very strange thing that happens in diaspora, um, and, and, and you become very aware of this, especially if you do certain kinds of cultural research. There are things in Jamaica that if I'm interested in, I can't find it in Jamaica. Um, because, you know, if coming from a country, you don't need to hold on to things. You are always that thing. You are always Jamaican. You are always Pakistan. You don't need to do anything to keep it. Um, but people who migrate, they have to preserve it. And so what happens is a weird kind of fossilization. And so you come to Brixton or you come to Peckham and you think, I've always heard about that, but I've never seen it in Jamaica, but it's preserved there. And here is this version of the Caribbean from the past. And you think, my God, people still use that word here. That's, <laughs> that's so fascinating. People still dress like that. No one dresses like that in Jamaica. And that's, that's really cool. Like I, I can just look at you and tell you, oh, that's when you came to England. You came in the 50s or you came in the 60s because that's how they dressed at that time and you've preserved it. And, and I don't find that awkward. I, I, I just find that kind of magical and cool, these, these, these kind of time capsules of another place that come to live in this other landscape.
Mm. And is, is food something that you still hold on to? Do you cook a lot of Jamaican food? Do you, is there a lot of Jamaican food to be found in Exeter? No, no, not really. So I love cooking, by the way, and cooking, uh, for me, there's, there are certain things that are home. So home is where I can cook. Um, if I can't cook, it's not home. Uh, so in an odd way, Jamaica is, doesn't become very homey because I don't tend to cook. You know, the kitchen is someone else's territory. And, and when I'm in Jamaica, I think, oh God, I want to go back home. And by that, I mean the place where my art is on the walls and my food is in the fridge. Uh, but, but then when I'm in, in the UK for, you know, more than three months, I think, oh God, I need to go home. <laughs> and, and, and that's interesting as well, how definitions change. Uh, so yes, I, I, I do cook a lot and cooking does remind me of home, but, but I'm aware of how tentative that is because if I go home now, meaning Jamaica, and I cook for my friends, uh, it, it's, it's weird because I love cooking for them, but in never, I think my style of cooking, I know it, it's very simple. People ask me, what do I cook? Okay, and I say pretentious. It's, it's very fancily plated. I, I just like, I, I, I like that whole idea. And so I go home and I cook and people go, ooh, that's the UK right there, ooh. <laughs> and it, it, it's always accused of not being Jamaican, you know, so. Oh, I, I, my mum, every time we go back to Ghana, she, they all call her these English names because she'll, she'll add like this spice that you get in Ghana, but you never get like ground up and like in a jar, you, you just pick it. And so they'll be like, oh, yeah. a jar of like thyme. <laughs> and she's always like, just leave me alone. Like it, it, it's, it, you've been using this for decades. And it's like, oh, but you know, um, oh, yeah. I love that. I love this idea though that home is where you can cook because I think for a lot of people that is very true. Um, I love how you can be transported in these places and suddenly your sense of reality of where you actually are gets uh, sort of yeah, a little bit mis just some yeah distorted. And I think the line that stood out for me was when you said it doesn't smell of Balti, it doesn't smell of curry, it smells of Mumbai. And I, I mean, being in Bristol when we were growing up, we had to go to London or Birmingham to get a lot of those spices, to get yeah. those clothes. I feel like I was going to Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, I know I'm going to go to Allen Rock Road. It's going to be full of Asians. And I'm going to go to it's, it's like going on a flight. And it does take you, it transports you completely to a space. And I think that's a, that was really powerful in the poem um, of recreating these spaces. Yeah. yeah, thanks. When I was a kid, my mum uh, worked for a while with lots of Indian people and she was invited to lots of weddings, had to get some clothes for the wedding, so we'd go to Southall. And I honestly was like, we're going to India. This is, <laughs> what is, what is this? Because, you know, you leave like Peckham and Brixton and then suddenly, yeah, it was more so than my relationships with like Peckham and Brixton and us or African people or Caribbean people. It was the Southall trips that would blow my mind because I honestly it was the most foreign place I think I went to for years and years and years, <laughs> um, which is magic I think because you get kids now who just are used to that and it's beautiful. Um, Kai, have you got some more poems for us? Okay, I'll read um, another poem which is how much it's, it's a bit of a bit longer and it's from my latest collection and and you'll see where things. It's not as on the nose, but I think what's behind the, the poem is me thinking about ideas of home and place, but what stands at the opposite of that, mm. um, and how those definitions... Anyway, um, you can ask me what's going on, because I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> right. The poem is called Hair That Was Here Before. Hair that was here before the invention of doors which was the invention of the outdoors, before the invention of town, which was the invention of the outskirts, the peripheries, before the invention of gates, which was the invention of the outside, the outsider, the barbarians in wait, it should be noted, there are many kinds of gates and many kinds of barbarians. In Jamaica, the gates of Kingston produce a kind offensively called butto. Hair that was here before the invention of keys, which was the invention of a lie, 
the world was somewhere else and we could close a door to it. Before the invention of curtains, which was the invention of spying nervously in your own backyard at night after the dogs bark, the motion sensor lights come on. You can see everything except what is behind the curtains. Before the invention of burglar bars, which was the invention of an art installation in Hopasha's Jamaica, a house surrounded entirely by steel, like a dollhouse in a birdcage. Before the invention of boundaries, which was the invention of fences, and also the invention of countries, countries being the invention of men wearing clothes the color of trees, patrolling the arbitrary lines, the dark promise of their rifles. Before the invention of stamps, which was the invention of bureaucracy, which was the invention of embassies, which was the invention of old women gathered hopelessly on Hope Road, the quartz of their sweat glistening on their foreheads. And hair that was here before the invention of hair, which was the invention of bear, before the invention of distance, which was the invention of letters, tear stained, held tight in the hands of the women gathered hopelessly on Hope Road, before the invention of place, which was the invention of the world as we know it now, before the invention of time, which was at once the invention of now and the invention of after and the invention of before, here that is here in the now and that was here in the before and that shall be here in the after, that shall hold our bodies, or cities, or, or outdated stamps in its endless cycle of green and brown and flower and thorn and stone. Thank you so much. Um, I know you said you can ask me afterwards, but yeah, where? I don't know. What does repetition do to ideas of home? That's the justice in my head. I don't know why that's in my head, but it is. Um, how did that poem start? What, 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 how did that start as a small thing before it spawned into this almost epic? Um, I guess I, I was thinking about just one fundamental thing about a, a home or a house and that mm. um, I can't remember what architect said it first that a home is the invention of two spaces. We only ever think about one. Um, but once you, once you put a house on a landscape, you've created two spaces. You've created outside and inside. But we only think about inside. And, and to think that home is necessarily the invention of outside and the outsider, um, you know, what, what does that do for me to think about homes and, 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 and belonging? That belonging is always unbelonging. Um, home always means there's an outsider. Once you have a sense of home and inside, you have a sense of who doesn't belong. And I just want, I was just trying to play on those, on those ideas of comfort and, and homeliness that necessarily alienate other people. And we don't think about the other side of that definition. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where the, that was the central thing that the poem sprawled out from. Definitely. I guess for every, yeah, for every home, there are people who don't belong in that home and, and people who maybe aren't in the home, but need to be out of the home and, need, and we yeah. need to have these boundaries that are so interesting. Yeah, it's, it, it's not a home unless you know who belongs and who is an outsider to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what's, what's, when I think of so many homes around, the, like physical homes around the world, um, in places like Jamaica and Pakistan and Ghana, the home space feels a lot more open to so many more people than the home space does here. Like mm. here, any of my friends just wandered into my house. <laughs> like my really close friends who might, you know, one has a key, but like if, if they just wandered in, I'd be like, what are you doing? Um, but mm. if I go and visit like my cousins, who's my same, who's the same age as me in Ghana, her friends literally just walk in and will make themselves food and will sit down where they want to sit and, and, it's, and you know they they'll live in a compound rather than just in yeah. a flat, and it those boundaries are just so much less defined. Um, mm. Not that they don't exist because obviously right. 
boundaries with family for example and not family but yeah I guess my, my physical home in in London is very different to any physical home I might have somewhere else yeah mm. I, I was blown away I loved that poem and funnily enough this morning on the school run my daughter one of the questions she asked me many questions and one of the questions was as we close the gate behind us why do we have gates she said why do we have gates mum <laughs> Why do we have gates? And I had no answer, and now I have an answer. I've got a whole poem. There you go. <laughs> it was just something that struck me, and um, I just listening to you to yes yeah, speak about space in that way because I think it was such a difficult question to answer. Why do we have gates? What does that mean about who's inside and who's outside? But also hostility, um, because I think whenever yeah. we, we think of comfort we think of love we think of but actually if there's a barrier there then what is on the other side of home and comfort and love um so i think that was just really beautifully summed up in that poem i sat there going yes to every line i love that yeah and it, it, it's something that that, that that i try to think about you know just just how do we how do we do that ethically that that how do we assert home and belonging but always be on the side of challenging those ideas like like how do you make home a space that is always expanding that is always accepting people that is always thinking about all right now that we've redefined home and now i've drawn you inside who else is on the outside and how do we how do we continually allow people into these spaces that we define as home and and i just think that's something i want to always think about yeah? that there's always going fundamental to the idea of home is that there's always going to be someone on the outside that never stops but how do i continually challenge myself to include the outsider mm. into that space that's beautiful um we're coming to the end and i had a different question but i might steal that as our final question because i think it's a beautiful one um how do we continually challenge ourselves to let people into our ideas of home how do we do that because, yeah, I don't know if I have an answer, but which is why I'm going to ask both of you. Um, because that is a, it's a challenge. It is. But maybe there are ways to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I think I take a lot of what my parents did before me. Mm. So I remember growing up as a teenager and actually hating the in and out of people coming in i'm doing homework and then aunts come in or when i went to visit my grandparents and my my cousins used to live with my grandparents and it was just a constant in and out of people which i found really unsettling but my parents i think took sort of made it part of the routine so made it that you expect people to come in so there's always an extra dish so whenever my mum cooked she'd cook a bit extra in case somebody turned up um, which I don't do, um, but I think the more that I'm spending time with my children, I'm making sure that they allow our home to be used in a similar way that my parents grew up having community in your home, not that you had to go out to community and find community. So we tend to have um, students stay with us from different parts of the world. And I think it's taken them a little while to get used to that and adjust to that. But it's been good we've been doing it for about a year and it's just really joyful we've enjoyed having company from somebody who's bringing entire different culture and different etiquette of how you use your home um into into our space but it's um yeah it's difficult how do you i think especially in the uk where you know you, you lock the door and um, you don't leave your windows when you leave the house because it is about barring that space um as opposed to connecting with the space mm. It's not enough, <laughs> no, but it's more thoughts that have been flung out, and I like that. Um, yeah. Hi. I, I mean, there are all kinds of little things that, that I, I, I guess one weird way in which I've changed being in this country too long is that whatever I feel uh, very passionately about, I think, oh my God, that's really earnest. I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> Which you know, I I I'd have completely gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way. <laughs> Some time ago, but one very very difficult thing that I've only recently challenged myself to do in my reading is to be more conscious of trying to read a perspective that I don't agree with. Um, 
like not a free or just an, another perspective that is that is outside of myself um that i i just realized that over the past 10 years i read in such an affirming way that's what i believe in um so i'm going to read that oh that sounds like um arsenal to my philosophy let me read that but to just read and not fringe opinion, but people who have thought about it, who I still might disagree with, but encounter their humanity on the page and just accept that, okay, this is how you have thought this through. I get it. Um, and that, that isn't easy. I, I cannot say that's been easy so far, but I am I'm forcing myself to do that, just to encounter other kinds of humanity and how you form those opinions, I think is important to me now, just especially thinking about how, how the world, how social media goads us into sticking to polarized opinions and, and, and also seeing like the middle ground as, as being irrational and something that should be avoided. And, and I think I don't want to be that person. And I know that's not a popular opinion for, as, you know, people who are kind of leftist and progressive, but I don't think I want to s s hold on to that kind of polarized way of it being a virtue to not encounter other people and their ideas. That's me. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess what is um, bringing people in to your homes, if not reading? Um, other perspectives, if not listening to poems from all sorts, and if not being here in some way, I feel like I've let you into my house in some small way, and I've been let into your home. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, all the time, Shagifta Kate Iqbal and Kai Miller. Thank you so much for being here with us, um, and thank you so much. Yeah, to thank you for having us. Oh, you're welcome. You are more than welcome. I have absolutely loved hosting this series. Um, also, because I just get to listen to the poems and ask questions and not actually read anything myself. It's the perfect gig. Um, <laughs> but thank you also to our lovely audience. Um, please join us next week for our final, our last and final part of this series, which is, yeah, I'll be sad to see it go. Um, but hopefully there'll be more series in the future. Apples and Snakes, I'd really enjoy that. I don't know why I'm whispering, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, one more time, if you would like to check out more of Kai Miller's work, his novel is called August Town and his poetry collection. Um, he's got lots of poetry collections, but I guess the one that I read and really loved, The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion is beautiful. Please check that out. And uh, Shagifta's collection, Jam is for Girls, Girls Get Jam is also available. Um, get them, read them, find their little moments of joy and light and life and their perspectives in them like I have uh, and thank you very much.